Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I want to encourage you to pick up your copy of Slime Incorporated. It's my first detective novel, and it's available in our store at store.greatdetectives.net, along with all of our ebooks and audiobooks. Well, now it's time for today's episode of Michael Shane. Uh, the original air date on this one is September the 24th of 1945. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. The ideal private detective, and of course we mean Mike Shane, is a fearful and wonderful combination. He has the courage of a movie hero, the all-knowing knowledge of a radio commentator, and the persistence of a bill collector. Right now, Mike and his lovely associate, Phyllis Knight, are developing another quality, the bedside manner of a doctor. The object of their attention is a very indignant young lady seated in Mike's office. And I want this man investigated, Mr. Shane. I want him prosecuted. Well... He can't call me a thief and get away with it. Yes, yes, Miss Agnew, but you see... If anyone's a thief, he is. He's unscrupulous, he's domineering, he's... Well, all that may be, Miss Agnew, but don't you think that you No one can work for the man. He's suspicious. He's a bully. He's a crook. And besides, he's crazy. Yes, sure, but Miss Agnew, I don't think you need a detective. Now, perhaps if you went to see some attorney, he... (sighs) Excuse me, please. Hello? Long distance, I have a person-to-person call from Claremont for Mr. Michael Shane. This is Mr. Shane speaking. Thank you. Here's your party, sir. Please signal when you're through talking. Hello? Hello, Mr. Shane? Yes? Who's this? My name is Pringle, Mr. Shane. William J. Pringle. Yes? I'm calling you because I want a private detective to shadow me for the next few days. A detective to shadow you? Say, what is this, a gag? I'm afraid of a certain man that's going to be murdered and that I'm going to be blamed for it. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I've just had a fight with this man. His name is G.W. Highland. Yes? I said I'd kill him myself if somebody else didn't beat me to it. He's got a half a dozen people who'd be glad to murder him. In fact, I heard another man threatened him today. And you want me to shadow you so I can prove your whereabouts in case this man is killed? That's right. I'm at my home in Claremont now, but I'll be glad to come across the bay. All right, sir. Look, can you make it at, uh, say, 2 o'clock? I'll be there. Goodbye, Mr. Shane. What were you talking about, Mike, in case the man gets killed? I'll tell you later, Angel. Huh? Now, now to get back to your problem, Miss Agnew, you say you work in an experimental laboratory and that your employer accuses you of stealing a chemical formula. Yes. He says I smuggled it to a competitor, an inventor named Burton Gordon Feldman. I'm positive it's the other way around. Mr. Feldman came storming into the office this morning and said Highland had stolen uh, the formula from him. He said uh, that Just he... a minute, please. What was your employer's name again? Highland. G.W. Highland? Yes. Phil, hmm? that's what the phone call was about. A man named Pringle told me he just threatened Mr. Highland's life. Well, of all... Are you sure it's the same G.W. Highland? Of course it is. I was in the middle of the whole fight. Pringle was arguing with Highland about one matter, Feldman was accusing Highland of thievery, and Highland was calling me a spy and tool for Feldman. Mm. Do you think Mr. Pringle and Mr. Feldman were justified? Certainly. All of us were. Feldman said that he'd bash Highland's head in if he used that formula. And I told Highland I was going to sue him. I was going to hire Mr. Shane to clear me of the whole nasty mess. Well, I'm not sure how much I can do about it, Miss Agnew. Uh, what's, uh, What's this man Highland's telephone number? Dawson 87421. Uh, His plant is down by the Bay Bridge Terminal. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'd like to talk to him. If he's conducting business, as you say he is, well, he'll have half of San Francisco gunning for him. Hmm. Hello? 
Hello, Mr. Hyland? No, I'm afraid you can't talk to Mr. Hyland. Well, this is very important. Tell him Mr. Shane is calling. I'm afraid I can't, sir. I'm afraid Mr. Hyland is dead. In fact, he's been murdered. Hello, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight. Hi, Sergeant. Well, looks like the inspector beat you here this time. Now, wait a minute. Don't go Chamber of Commerce on us, Sergeant. After all, we sort of telephoned for the inspector. I know, I know. He's inside the plant. I'll open the door for you. All right, please. Good night, an iron door. What is this, the state armory or a prison? That's the way it was run. Like a prison. Iron doors, barred windows, burglar alarms in every room to guard Highland's precious secrets. <laughs> Listen to those 40, 11 different sounds, Mike. What does yeah. this plant manufacture? Oh, mostly experimental stuff. Plastic chemistry, metabolic research, new dye formulas. Oh. Angel, there's the inspector looking out that doorway. Inspector! Well, kids, I guess there's no doubt about this case. It's murder in capital letters. Oh, Inspector. Where's the body? In the next room, Phil. And the young lady with you? Jane Agnew. I was Mr. Highland's assistant. Yes, she came to see me about her boss, Inspector. I'll tell you about it later. Okay, Mike. Now, you want to see the body? Yes, of course. He was killed in this next office, if that's what you'd call the place. It's crammed with gadgets and gauges and stuff. Uh-huh. I see. Fell face downwards. Yeah, the bullet hit him in the heart. Fell clear through his body and punctured that metal tank up on the wall. Yeah, uh-huh. Drilled a hole right through the tank. What's that? That dark blue liquid dripping all over the floor? That's Highland's secret dye formula. The formula he accused me of stealing for Mr. Feldman. I've made a brief examination of the body. Highland carried a revolver in a shoulder holster. Gun was still in it. Well, that means the murderer took him by surprise. Yeah, I figured that, Mike. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Mr. Waters, will you come in here, please? Yes. This is the man who found the body. Oh, oh Mr. Waters, Mr. Shane, Miss Knight. How do you do? I guess you know Miss Agnew. Oh, yes. You're the Mr. Shane who phoned Mr. Highland right after I discovered his body. Yeah, that's right. Uh, did you, uh, did you hear the shooting? No. I was out in the blending room where we control our dye manufacturer. You see that feeder pipe running from the formula tank on the wall? Hmm? Yes. Yes? Well, it runs out to the blending room. I was watching my time and pressure graph on the feeder pipe. Suddenly, the pressure began to drop. I came back here to the office to see what was wrong with the tank. Uh-huh. And uh, how long was that before I telephoned? Oh, I would say less than a minute. Of course, I don't know how long before that Mr. Highland died. Well, as I recall, it was about ten minutes past noon when I tried to telephone him. But that doesn't tell us the time of death either. Mike? Yeah? Mike, I think you better get hold of your client over in Claremont. Huh? Mr. Pringle? Mm-hmm. I just found this slip of paper on the floor by the wastebasket. It looks like Highland's dying message. It says, Pringle killed me. And it's signed, Highland. <laughs> The inventor and manufacturer, G.W. Highland, lies dead on the floor of his laboratory, surrounded by his own strange inventions and machinery. In the same laboratory, Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a scrawled message that points directly to the murderer. Pringle kill me. Sign Highland. Hmm. I'd like to hear Mr. Pringle's explanation of this note. Well, maybe we'll have it in a few minutes. I phoned Claremont. Pringle said he'd come right over. You didn't tell him why we wanted to see him, did you, Mike? Oh, no, no. I wish Miss Agnew and Mr. Waters could decide if the note is in Highland's handwriting. Well, I can't tell, Miss Knight. It's written in such a scrawl. Mm -hmm. Mr. Waters, have you ever seen him write like that? No, but Highland never wrote in death agony either. Well, maybe we can get somewhere by comparing it with samples of Highland's normal writing. There should be some letters in his desk. Inspector? Yeah? You say you found a gun on Highland? Yeah, and a shoulder holster. Then what's this doing in the desk drawer? What? Another gun. A forty-five. Apparently hasn't been fired. Everything clean and proper. Well, that must be another one of his guns. 
Highland insisted that everybody in the plan carry a revolver with him, whether man or woman. Oh, oh, I see. I was wondering why Mr. Waters had a revolver strapped to his waist. Do you have a list of all the guns issued to the employees? Oh, yes. As I remember, Highland kept it in the desk. Yes, I've just found it. Uh, Inspector, yeah. what's the serial number on that gun? Let's see. 207-39-724. 207-39-724. That's odd. It's not here on the list. I think it'd be a good idea to check all the guns in the plant. Mr. Waters, may I see your revolver, please? Oh, of course. The last time I fired it was at target practice two weeks ago. Uh-huh. Oh, Highland wanted you all to be handy with guns, huh? Uh-huh. Fully loaded and clean. Now, your gun, Miss Agnew. Well, I'll have to get it from my desk. Highland asked me to carry my gun with me, but I never did. What? Why, it's gone. Huh? My gun's gone. You sure? When did you see it last? Well, I... I don't know. A a couple of days ago, maybe. You have no idea where it is? No, none. Somebody must have taken it. Miss Agnew, you gave Miss Knight and me a sketchy account of the quarrel with Mr. Highland this morning. Would you mind repeating it for the inspector? Well, I don't know everything that took place. I... I was upstairs getting some data on the new process. When I got back to the office, I heard Mr. Pringle's voice. He was shouting that he would kill Highland if he didn't do something. If he didn't do what? I never found out. Mr. Feldman was waiting outside to see Highland. He walked in right behind me and started calling Highland a thief. That he'd stolen Feldman's own secret dye formula. Highland said it was a lie. He said the truth was that Feldman had stolen the formula from him. And that Jane was Feldman's go-between. You heard all this, Mr. Waters? That part of it. Mr. Feldman was pounding the desk and shouting that he would batter Highland's head in. What is Mr. Feldman's full name? Burton Gordon Feldman. Thank you. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Get hold of Mr. Feldman and ask him to come down here at once. Yes, sir. No worries. Miss Agnew, why did Mr. Highland accuse you of stealing the formula for Mr. Feldman? Well, he was in a spot. He was passing the buck. He was accusing me because Mr. Feldman had accused him. Excuse me, Mr. Shane. Yes? Is Mr. Pringle here to see you? Oh, yes, yes. We'll be right out. On second thought, Mike, let's not tell Pringle about Highland's note. Okay, Inspector. Mr. Pringle? I'm Mr. Shane. Oh, yes. Mr. Shane, something strange has happened. Right after I phoned your office, I discovered my revolver was missing from my desk. Huh? I got to worrying that... Your revolver missing? Do you uh, have its serial number? Yes, yes. I wrote it down on this paper here. I want to report it to the police and Look at this serial number, Inspector. Mm. 207-39-724. It's the same number. Mr. Pringle, your gun is in Highland's desk. What? Yes, Mr. Pringle. Step inside and we'll uh, show you something else. Highland. Good heavens. Why, this is terrible. And I threatened to kill him not two hours ago. Mr. Pringle, what was your car quarrel with Highland about? Well, you, you you see, I'm a contracting engineer. I asked Highland to build me a new experimental turbine. He promised it in 90 days. Mm-hmm. On that promise, I signed a contract with a big customer of mine. And Mr. Highland didn't live up to your contract? No. And it means that I lose $50,000. You blame me for wanting to kill him? Mr. Pringle, we've been wondering why both you and Miss Agnew happened to choose the same private detective for your problems. Well, Miss Agnew and Highland were having a terrific fight. I heard her say that she was going to hire Mr. Shane and put Mr. Highland behind bars. I thought it would be a good idea to have the same detective. Mr. Pringle, about what time did you leave Highland's office? Well, uh, I went directly from here to the Bay Bridge Terminal and there caught the 1120 train for Claremont. I must have left here about uh, 11.15. And you phoned me from your home in Claremont a few minutes past noon. Was Highland alone when you left, Mr. Pringle? No. Miss Agnew and Mr. Waters were with him and a Mr. Feldman. Uh Uh-huh. When did you leave, Miss Agnew? Well, I would say about 11.40. I went right up to see Mr. Shane and you. And when did Mr. Feldman leave? Just a few minutes later. I was the last one to leave the office. I would say about 12 noon. In other words, Highland was alive at 12 noon and dead at 10 minutes past noon when I tried to telephone him here at the office. Inspector? Yes, Sergeant? I just talked to Mr. Feldman on the phone. Good. Is he on his way down? No, sir. He's at his home. He said he couldn't be bothered. And that if Highland was murdered, it was a darn good thing. And if you want to talk to him, you can come out to his house. Couldn't be bothered. Stubborn, eh? Okay, Sergeant, take a couple of the boys and bring him down here. Uh, look, I got a better idea, Inspector. Yeah? If he's stubborn, we'll get more information by going to him. In fact, that that uh, may really bother him. You're right, Mike. Sergeant, take over here. 
The car will be along any minute. Meanwhile, we're going to bother Mr. Feldman at his home. That's correct, sir. I told your police sergeant that I would not budge out of my house for Mr. G.W. Highland, alive or dead. I see. Well, we won't comment on the attitude you take, Mr. Feldman. But it's that sort of non-cooperation which forces us to question some witnesses at police headquarters. I thought you weren't going to comment. Mr. Feldman, we understand you had a conversation, uh, a quarrel with Mr. Highland this morning. I did. Otherwise, you would not be here playing cat and mouse with me. Uh, we came, Mr. Feldman, because we learned that you had threatened to kill Mr. Highland. If you wish my exact words, madam, I said I would bash his head in. I gave Highland 24 hours to return my special dye formula and to stop its production. Are you certain that Mr. Highland pirated the formula from you? Positive. The man is a direct descendant of Captain Kidd. Besides, I verified the fact by a little theft of my own. Would you mind explaining? As I was leaving his plant, I stole a test tube of the formula. I've just analyzed it. It's identical to my own product, which I'm about to place on the market. Mm. Hmm? Do you know how and when Highland stole it from you? No, no, I've been trying to find out. Highland accused his own assistant of being my go-between. I'm sure he got that idea when he saw Miss Agnew and myself eating dinner together last week. Oh, you knew uh, Miss Agnew socially? She is a very capable research woman, a Ph.D. I was and I am trying to persuade her to join my own staff. And that was the purpose of your dinner? The only purpose, Inspector. Mr. Feldman, do you remember about what time you left Highland's office? Yes, it was about uh, 11.45... When I reached my apartment here, the chimes of Grace Cathedral were ringing the noon hour. 11.45. That's right. Uh One final question, Mr. Feldman. Do you own a revolver? No. And if I did, I certainly would not use my own gun to kill Highland. Bullets can be traced. You're right, Mr. Feldman. Bullets can be traced. And that's exactly what we hope to do. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. I suggest we go to headquarters right now and see what ballistics have found out. I've got the report, kids. Ballistics say the bullet that went through Highland's heart and punctured the chemical tank was a forty-five caliber. Oh, fine, fine. The list of guns issued to Highland's employees were all forty-fives, And Mr. Pringle's, too? Yes, and even if we find the right gun, we won't know who fired it. Inspector? Yeah? Coroner just phoned about the Highland case. Says the man died between 11.50 and 12.05. I see. Okay, thanks. Well, that doesn't help us too much. You know, kids, I've got an idea how we can tell when Highland died. You have? How? You remember Fred Waters said that he discovered the body after he noticed something was wrong with the the flow from that uh, tank in Highland's office? Yeah, sure, but I don't see what that... Well, Waters said that he saw the change recorded on the time and pressure gauge out in the blending room. Don't you get it? Yes. Yes, Phyllis, my angel. Ha, ha! You're not only beautiful, you're downright brilliant, Doc. Oh, gee, thanks. Inspector, <laughs> Inspector, let's yeah. head back to the plant and perform a little experiment. A very important experiment. I'll be glad to do it, Mr. Shane, but the minute we fill this tank up with the dye formula will drip right out through the bullet hole. That's precisely the point, Mr. Waters. Yes, uh, start pouring the buckets into the tank, please. Uh, let's see. The graph in the blending room shows how much fluid was in the tank at 11.30. Uh-huh. We know the time when the tank drained dry. Now, all we have to do is fill it up to that level, then clock how long it takes to drain through the bullet hole and the feeder pipe. Yeah. And then we can compute the exact minute that the bullet punctured the tank. And the exact minute that Highland was killed. The tank's ready, Mr. Shane. Thank you. 
In the laboratory of the murdered inventor, a secret formula slowly drips from the bullet hole in a metal tank. Watching tensely are Mike Shane, Phyllis, and the inspector. Well, I guess that's it. The tank is completely drained. Mm -hmm. According to my watch, it took 11 minutes. Mr. Waters, what was the exact time that the flow stopped out in the blending room? Well, the time and pressure graph on the feeder pipe read 17 minutes past noon. 12.17. The tank drained through the bullet hole in 11 minutes. 11 subtracted from 12.17 makes 12.06. Then at 12.06, the bullet punctured the tank. At 12.06, the same bullet went through Highland's heart. Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. I have Mr. Feldman here. I told here. you people I wouldn't be bothered about Highland. This policeman came to my yes, house Yes, I system. sent him, Mr. Feldman. Oh? I wanted you here. I'm sorry if it's inconvenient, but we are trying to solve a murder. Mr. Feldman, what time did you say you left uh, Highland's office? I told you very clearly and distinctly, about 11.45. And what time did you leave, Mr. Pringle? Around 11.15. I took the 11.20 train for Claremont. And you, Miss Agnew? About 11.40. Mr. Waters? Around 11.50. Oh, that isn't what you told us before, Mr. Waters. You said you left this office at noon. That was just my guess. Since then, I checked my production chart in the blending room. I find I wrote an entry in it at 11.55. And apparently all of you were out of the office long before 12.06, when Highland was murdered. Yes, of course. Of course we were. The sergeant has checked on everybody else in the plant. He's examined all their guns. You know, there's one last possibility, Inspector. Somebody yeah. might have stood outside in the alley and fired a gun through that open window. I'm not sure it could be done, okay, Phil. Okay, let's find out. Let's go outside of the alley. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose somebody could fire a gun through this window. If he was standing on a stepladder or somebody's shoulders. The window is at least ten feet from the ground. From down here in the alley, all a man could fire at would be the office ceiling. Oh, it's got me stumped, kids. We have four suspects. We find a note. We kids! Got... What? Oh, kids, I've been the prize dope. A complete blue ribbon dope. What are you talking about? Inspector, you couldn't solve this case. Phil, you couldn't solve it. The police couldn't solve it. I'm the only person who had the answer, and I didn't even know. Well, for Pete's sake, give it to us. I will, Inspector. I will, just as soon as we get back inside that laboratory. Mr. Shane, if you've got the solution to this murder, I wish you'd tell us. I'd like to go home. Just stands there at the window looking out into thin air. I'm waiting for something, gentlemen. Oh, by the way, Mr. Feldman... You say you were home at your apartment at uh, 12.06. I believe I told you that, sir. And, Miss Agnew, you were in our office talking to Miss Knight and myself. Certainly, you know I was. And I was in the blending room checking my gauges and masters. And Mr. Pringle was at his home in Claremont. That's right. Uh, where about in Claremont do you live, Mr. Pringle? Why, on the hill above the hotel. Oh? Do the key system trains ever keep you awake at night? Key system trains? Yes, well, there isn't even a streetcar line within ten blocks of my house. Inspector, do you yeah. see what's coming down the ramp from the Bay Bridge right now? Sure, one of the key system trains is going into the terminal. Listen to it. Well, what about it? We've heard at least 20 trains on the bridge today. Yeah. Yes, Angel, but the first time I heard a key system train was on the telephone. When Mr. Pringle called me at the office... What are you talking about? You did not telephone me from Claremont, Mr. Pringle. You telephoned me from this laboratory or somewhere within the sound of the train. You called me at uh, 12.08, about two minutes after you had killed Highland. Mr. Shane, I telephoned you long distance. Yes, that's what I thought. I thought the... I heard the operator say it was a person-to-person -person call from Claremont. Of course. Ah, yes. There's probably an explanation. The fact remains that I did hear behind your phone conversation the distinct sound of a train coming off the Bay Bridge. I didn't recognize the sound until five minutes ago. Then Highland did write that note. With his last dying effort, he named the murderer. Then that note was a fake, a frame-up. Why, we're clear across the bay. Shane admits he heard the telephone operator. Yes, but I... Hello? Who? Oh, just a minute. For you, Mike. Long distance from New York. New York? Who could be calling me from New York? Hello? Mr. Shane, this is New York calling. I have a person-to-person -person call for you. Go ahead, please. Hello? Who is this? Hi, Mike. How do you like my long distance voice? Phil, where are you? Shh, in the next room. I thought I'd let you know how to fake a long distance call. <laughs> Angel, remind me to kiss you. 
Well, there's your answer, Inspector. That was Phyllis in the next room. Pringle either got some girl to pretend to be the phone operator or he used a falsetto voice himself. That's it, Mr. Shane. I remember. Pringle called up here several times and impersonated a woman. He did it for a gag. No, no, I... You... You don't understand. We understand perfectly, Mr. Pringle. It was a very convincing gag. So convincing you thought you could get away with murder. Well, Inspector, I guess that winds up the case. <laughs> Sorry I kept you waiting so long, kids. Pringle insisted on giving us a speech along with his confession. Hmm. I'll bet. I'll bet it was all about Highland. What a no-good character he was. Yeah. Seems about ten years ago, Highland pulled another chip. Stole a chemical invention from Pringle and wrecked Pringle's whole business. He never forgot it. Then the motive was revenge. Hmm. Why on earth did Pringle leave his gun right in Highland's desk? He was using psychology on us. Oh. He figured if he left a clue so obviously pointing at himself, the police just wouldn't believe it. Oh, it almost worked. Yeah. You know, I was really suspicious of Jane Agnew. It's darn funny she couldn't find her gun. I, uh, I found it, Angel. You did? When? After yeah. we were all done. It was in the bottom drawer of her desk with a heavy file on top of it. Say, Mike, do you think she was holding out on us? Uh-uh. No, Inspector. Jane hated Highland, and I think she realized how dangerous her mood was. So she hid her gun to prevent herself from killing him, and then forgot where she hid it. You know, that's an idea. Place an obstacle in front of yourself whenever you get any wild ideas. Mm. I must remember that with you, Mike. Well, Angel, what are you talking about? You don't hate me. Oh, no, no, just the opposite. But, uh, that can be a dangerous mood, too. What? Why, Angel? (laughs) Tune in again next week for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. This is Andrea J. Graham, author of the Web Surfer series. Oh, and a man and wife. You're listening to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. Welcome back. Uh, a great setting for this mystery and some uh, very well uh, placed clues as usual. I should say that this is the last in the line of uh, episodes that were recently uh, discovered in the last few years. Um, we will be bringing you two more episodes from 1947 that have been in circulation for uh, quite a while, uh, relatively. Uh, well, now we do turn to listener comments and feedback. And uh, we have a comment from Laura who says, When I was listening to the story, I started to realize just how progressive the show is. Phyllis is expected to come with Mike to every crime scene, no matter how gory, keep her cool, and help find clues. Though she is often assigned to uh, stay behind... She jumps right in and will interrogate the people involved. And her opinion is respected. Pretty amazing for the time. Uh, She's really a partner in the investigations. I like and respect this show more with every episode. Well, thanks so much for the comment, Laura. And I I do have to agree. Um, Probably in terms of strength of uh, a uh, female character... Uh, this is, uh, or, or I should say as a, the uh, assistant, this is 
probably as uh, good as it gets. Probably the closest to this was uh, Let George Do It with Brooksy, but I think that Phyllis is written even stronger. And part of that, I think, uh, has to do with the caliber of actress that uh, Kathy Lewis was. I don't think she would have uh, probably signed on to do a regular uh, role as a... Uh, Patsy Bowen uh, type character. Or even if she would have, the creative team on this uh, program recognized that that would have been a real uh, waste of her uh, talent. But I do think it's a treat, regardless of how it uh, came about. And then we do have a comment on Twitter from Jim Yates, who just simply says, uh, I love it. Uh, th thanks so much. And I do appreciate everybody who's uh, likes the show on Twitter or likes the show on Facebook and uh, shares the post. It increases increases the reach of our post. Uh, it helps new people discover the show. So uh, thank you so much. And I encourage people to uh, continue to do that. All right. Well, that will do it for today. We will be back tomorrow with the Avenger. Next week, or coming next Thursday, Boston Blackie. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. Become one of our...